the Oxford Martin School for this second of four conversations about the Dasgupta Review on the Economics of Biodiversity. My name is Cameron Hepburn, director of the Smith School and a lead researcher for a number of several OMS research programs. And I'm delighted that we have today Inga Anderson with me, who I'll introduce, introduce properly in just a moment. The, the first conversation in the series with Professor Sapatha Dasgupta was pretty wide ranging. Those of you who tuned in will remember, we ventured into some fairly important areas, some heavily contested territory, managing human population, perhaps the limits to growth. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, it seems like a lot of you did too, because there were a huge number of questions, dozens and dozens, in fact. Um, uh, and if you missed it, you can catch up on the Oxford Martin School website. Now, all of these questions um, that were kind of tabled, we didn't have time to answer all of them, but they included the ethics of pricing nature, the role of capitalism, and quite a lot of policy questions and questions around international coordination. And, and that's why I'm delighted with today's guests. Uh, so we're going to pick up some of them today. And actually, if we don't get to all of them today, there'll be further opportunities in this series on the 3rd of June with Professor Dame Henrietta Moore and Professor Sir Giles Godfrey, and then on the 17th of June with Professor Natalie Seddon. So as foreshadowed, today we have Inga Anderson, the Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Programme. Inga has had a really illustrious career within international organizations and, as I said, is the ideal guest to follow Partha on these questions that fundamentally involve issues of international coordination. Between 2015 and 2019, she was Director General of the International Union of Conservation of Nature, for the Conservation of Nature, the IUCN as we know it, uh, 15 years at the World Bank, including multiple leadership positions, uh, including Vice President for Sustainable Development, and has spent uh, 12 years before that on drought desertification and water management at the UN. Um, she's a Dane, uh, and I'm pleased to say that her tertiary education was in the UK uh, and with a master's at SOAS focusing on economics and development. So um, Inga and I were both on the Dusgupta Review Advisory Panel. We had the pleasure of watching the, the huge, here it is, 604-page uh, report develop. And actually, in case you missed it, UNEP and Oxford have been collaborating uh, on uh, observing the economic recovery. We launched a recent report together, Are We Building Back Better? And the, the report is online as it's the launch event with IMF um, Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva and Inga as well. And Brian O'Callaghan, who led the work at Oxford, and I'm really grateful to Inga and Stephen Stone uh, from UNEP for their partnership. So today, I want to explore Inga's thoughts about the review, the post-2020 biodiversity framework, nature-based solutions, the intersections with climate change, the green recovery, and obviously anything you want us to explore too. The ask a question button is where it usually is, down the bottom on the right, uh, so please do use it. But let's start, Inga, with a very general question. What do you think the most significant conclusions from the review are, and how has it changed the conversation for you? Well, first of all, thank you for having me and greetings from Nairobi, uh, where UNEP is headquartered, the only UN organization in the Global South. Uh, we're very uh, headquartered in the Global South, which we're very proud of, together with UN Habitat. So at any rate, like, look, the Dasgupta review is interesting from so many points of view, but I mean, sort of at the very basic level, it, it speaks to nature is an asset class and don't forget that don't ignore that actually nature in the broader economy plays a role that has not been valued and we can get back to the ethics of valuing etc which i always get uh, um, when i speak uh, especially with conservation colleagues obviously um, but 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 that in and of itself is significant and then of course this this understanding that partha puts forward that economic thinking has been flawed in that it hasn't understood that value and mm. therefore it has assumed that this is an externality this is something that is available you can essentially exploit nature for the benefit of economy and society and that it as, is infinite and and bringing that understanding that it is not infinite and i think climate change biodiversity loss pollution and waste and desertification shows us some of those elements that the, the, the carrying capacity, the limits on uh, planetary boundaries, as 
as the Stockholm Environment Resilience Institute has spoken, those things are now showing up and they're showing up more as we expand our population. So I think those issues are really critical. The Stern Review back in the day was critical because it put the economics of climate change firmly on a footing of economic thinking in the financial world. Um, and that was critical at the time. My hope is obviously, and, and it was important because it was done by uh, uh, Treasury and not by, um, you know, environment ministers who I have the greatest respect for, but it's really important that it happened outside of our sector, so to speak. Ditto for this thing now, for the Dasgupta review. And what we hope very much is that it will begin to ride that wave of getting a broader understanding in the economic thinking. Um, because what we know is that the stock of natural capital has declined. Whilst we have, in, while we, whilst we have greatly increased produced capital, but a 40% or so decline in natural capital and a significant increase in, in produced capital. Mm -hmm. So what does that tell us? We haven't been stewards of, of the planet as we should have been. And the review puts points this out very much. Great. That's a super set of points to start off with. I want to come back to this, um, you know, forty percent decline in natural capital. But I just know we're going to get it in the questions. The the ethics of pricing nature, sure, uh, and as you say, you, you always get it too. I've actually written on it uh, because it ended up being plaguing me. So so let's knock that one off. Um, is it okay? to put an economic value on nature? Are we not pricing the priceless? Are we not devaluing all of the dimensions of nature that really matter when we stick it into a finance ministry and onto a spreadsheet? Is this not part of the problem, not part of the solution? No, it's very much part of the solution. And the reason why it's part of the solution is that we shouldn't juxtapose these things. Nature has infinite value to culture, to language, to poetry, to art, to religions, to you and I, to our lives, to our well-being, to our happiness, to love, to all of these intangible things where nature plays a part. But that does not mean that we can cut the proverbial forest empty or, or cut the proverbial forest down and have a great quarterly return and think that everything will be A-OK. -okay. That does not mean that the mangrove is not protecting that community and that we don't understand the value of that against a concrete seawall. So having an understanding that the value that ecosystems provide to, to, human, to humanity just is, it just exists. That community that sits behind that massive buffer of a mangrove knows the value of that mangrove. And understanding that that, other than a seawall, has also other other i mean that's where fish spawn that's where you can have crayfish that's where you can do uh, lots of other uh, economic activities so this is not about putting dollar signs on trees this is not about putting a value on a butterfly but it is understanding that this superbly intricate system of species and interdependence has its own beauty the intrinsic value which is completely incontestable but at the same time the economic value we have not understood and we have not valued adequately when we understand a nation's wealth which is why we at UNEB are working on inclusive wealth and on understanding uh, what wealth means in terms of natural capital so I, I don't see it and when I speak about it with with certain communities that that feel quite strongly about this, we have to understand it from their perspective. Indigenous peoples, for example, often feel that this is very alienating and very um, and that it undermines their indigenous rights, their yeah. rights. And, and, and that is so because if you just look at it purely on the value of that proverbial forest versus the value that they ascribe to it, yes. But that's not what we argue. What we argue is understanding that that value has a broader value for community and for society as a whole. So going back to, thank you, I think that's very helpful to, to clarify that early, although the questions are already uh, coming in on that point. Um, sure. In terms of inclusive wealth, as you say, UNEP has been leading the way here and World Bank's been doing work as well on 
getting more comprehensive, more inclusive sets of national accounts. And when you look at those national accounts, as you say, our natural capital is not exactly in good shape. Uh, that's to understate it. I mean, as Parth has said, we are in an extinction event. So if we're in an extinction event, what are the top priority actions for the world? I mean, who has to do what and when? What, what's the kind of to-do list for humanity right now? It might be useful to sort of create some buckets around these action lists, the to-do lists <laughs> for governments, right? They set the yardsticks for how we, companies, industries, communities, localities behave. So they need to understand what yardsticks they're setting. Um, natural capital accounting, are they going to take that into decision making, understanding the degradation that companies or, or others um, cause? Are they willing to set, um, to understand the inclusive wealth dimension of of the responsibilities that making laws and rules and regulations uh, give governments. Are they willing to put a price on carbon? Are they willing to put incentives to decarbonize? Are they willing to phase out harmful subsidies? Are they willing to put a tax on pollution? Are they willing to redirect uh, subsidies away from fossil fuels and towards renewables? Are they willing to um, um, subsidize or move away from harmful agricultural subsidies, never making the farmers the enemies, but making it possible for the farmers to farm in nature positive ways. These are the kind of sort of to do items for governments. And we as voters have an opportunity to impact in that regard, right? So then there are the intergovernmental organizations, be they non government, oh, sorry, be they UN or non UN. I had the privilege of working for IUCN, which is not UN, but nevertheless. And so they need to work in enabling, at least if they're in the environmental sphere, enabling a broader understanding of what science says so that it can enable good policy decisions. I was at the World Bank when we initiated the WAVES, the Wealth Accounting Evaluation of Ecosystem Services, which was sort of a forerunner for many of the things that we're talking about today. Um, and so I think that there is a real opportunity here for multilateral organizations to, to roll this, to understand and pursue some of this, but always understanding community rights, always understanding indigenous people's rights, and not just with a check, but uh, agree, a, a check, but, but really understanding that the value of community managed um, and indigenous peoples managed um, area in terms of biodiversity wealth is often way exceeding uh, national parks and, that, uh, and, and protected areas. So, um, so in, international intergovernmental organizations. Financial institutions, well, mm -hmm. you know, a huge role because the portfolio of investments from bankers to insurers to, to, um, to investors, uh, um, is is such that it can be shifted towards nature positive. Um, and that's why um, a task force on nature related disclosures is being now discussed. How will an investment portfolio realign itself? And that is for your pension and mine. That is for your mortgage and mine. <laughs> so let's understand how we do that, right? So it's not just some abstract thing. It's when we take a loan for buying that car as well. So understanding how uh, how um, how how the banking industry, the investment investors, as well as insurers can realign, and then of course business. I don't need to go into that. That's obvious. And then finally, the choices that we as individuals make, you and I, you know, what do we buy? How do we consume? How do we live? Uh, etc. And often that is sort of thought as a, as an afterthought by individuals. Oh, what can I do? I'm such a small consumer, you know, in the big scheme of seven and a half billion. The truth is that the world is made up of seven and a half billion, and each and every one of us have a choice to make in our consumption patterns and in our uh, yeah in our footprint. So all of that. That's kind of a long to do list, but you need to look at it in each of the buckets. No, I was thinking it is quite a long to-do list, and I'm glad you did put it into those buckets of government, kind of international institutions, NGOs, financial institutions, business, and individuals. And I guess you know, if if I were a teenager, I'd be looking at uh, people like you and me, and and thinking, um, why 
why haven't we done this already? I mean, it's it's not as if this is really news to any of us. What's the blockage? Where are the are the personal incentives of the leaders of these organisations lined up to do what they need to do, or is there something? You know, why, why do we have all these huge fossil fuel subsidies, uh, and how do we actually get rid of them? I mean, there is a short termism built into our system, our electoral system. You have a cycle for four or five years your quarterly report of your company return, what have you. This is short termism that does not take into account intergenerational equity, that does mm -hmm. not take into account the fact that we are shaving away at the very foundations for future wealth and sustainability, if I may say so. And that's that's the difficult conversation because maybe it is easier for me as a politician or as a business person to just deal with the short termism. Now, the good thing is that more and more people have understood that actually the intergenerational and the longer term perspective is real. Um, and it is about investing in the future, that you will create better jobs, that you will create opportunities. It is about redirecting uh, investments towards renewable, sustainable, and nature positive. But these things only happen with governments living up to the commitments. Look, in 2010, governments turned up in Nagoya, um, in Japan, for what was COP10 of biodiversity. And at that point, I was there with a different hat, but it's in, in material. And I was there for the, bio, uh, for the World Bank. And at that point, we agreed to what was called the Aichi targets. They are actually really rather good. These 20 targets, they're hard to measure. So, but you know, in principle, and government signed up to them, but nobody has lived up to them. So that's not acceptable. Um, and I think with what we're now seeing, there is a much greater awareness that it has to take an all of society approach. It has to take um, us holding our politicians and leaders to account and calling out those that are not living up to it. If we look at the carbon side, the climate side, we understand that, yes, everyone needs to shift. We need ambitious NDCs, but the G20 has a special to-do list because they are over, they are over 70 or nearly 80 percent of carbon emissions. So we need to understand the inequity between nations in this, and the same is the case for biodiversity, understanding how we need to, this is a global common good, but it is hosted often in very poor countries. So understanding that we have access to resources, access to um, transparency and access to uh, support and capacity building and technology. So we haven't done it well enough. And now really is the time to move that needle because we can no longer, as if as the, the sort of IPCC equivalent uh, to to for the Biodiversity Convention, which we are proud to host, um, points out we have about 7.8 million species on this good earth, and we're set to lose 1 million if we don't take action. And that will cause inevitably ecosystem impacts that we cannot, well, I can get into that, but it's will have severe impacts, just think pollinators and losing losing pollination. Yeah, well, it's clearly a very I mean, complex social, technical, political system that we're operating in. But if I was to try to um, synthesize, in a sense, what you've just said, you use the word awareness uh, several times. Uh, and I, I guess all of these incentives become, whether you're the head of a financial institution, the head of a government, if your voters are demanding it, your shareholders are demanding it, then it becomes a whole lot easier to deliver. Uh, and perhaps that awareness is, is one of the most important um, dimensions uh, to cover. Um, if I might pick up on something else, you noted you were there in Nagoya uh, wearing a different hat. You, you wear, in a sense, quite a powerful hat now as the head of UNEB. Um, I'm sure there are people listening in thinking, well, can you solve it? Come on, UNEP. Uh, what are your top priorities? Come on, UNEP. Come on, UNEP. Go, UNEP. What, what can we see from you in the coming year? Uh, where, where are you working hardest right now? Look, we look at three planetary crises that unless we tackle these and tackle these with real sincerity and, and determination, um, it's, a, it's a future we cannot even contemplate. 
and the three crises, planetary crises, are climate change, obviously, I don't need to explain that to anyone, nature and biodiversity loss, and uh, waste and pollution, the toxic trail of our economic development that is essentially poisoning and toxifying the planet, right? And what is it that is driving these? It is unsustainable consumption and production. It is the very way in which society works. We take stuff out of the environment, resources, etc., our food and so on, um, uh, energy, and then we put it into the economy and the society, which is a fine thing because it enables us to have the life that we have. But when we're done with it, we discard it as waste right back into the environment or as, as depletion into the environment. That is so so that's sort of at the macro level so what does that then mean it means that for us delivering the science ipas which we're also pr proud to well, ipcc which we're also proud to co-host with our friends at wmo ipas as well as global chemicals outlook etc cetera, etc cetera, the international resource panel that science that tells us about this and then working with member states for example, right now, working with member states to help them get on the low carbon trajectory through the NDCs. But also we issue, for example, on the climate size, the emissions gap report that gives a report card. And last year we gave a report card to the G20 because it is very clear that we will work with Samoa and we will work with the Gambia and we will work with Honduras. But that is not where we have the big emissions and we need to focus on the G20. And so uh, holding a sort of report card up and saying this is what needs to happen. That's on climate. On biodiversity, clearly supporting and, and enabling that we get an ambitious post-2020 biodiversity framework. Renewed targets that are measurable and implementable and are fundable and doable. And that means an all of society approach. And on, finally, pollution and waste. Dealing with circularity. Again, in the EU setting, the circular um, economy is coming into fore. The same in the UK, there's a lot of interest in circularity, but also uh, obviously working through uh, with our friends at WTO and other places on the trade related dimensions that one can encourage you know, to tackle all three of these crises. Now, 2021 is a really full year in terms of the calendar because lots of things sort of got pushed into out of 2020, 2020. and um, I won't go through the whole calendar, but everybody knows COP26, everybody, I hope, knows COP15, Kunming. Many people will know that we are launching the Decade for Ecosystem Restoration on World Environment Day on the 5th of June, which will be that decade to massively support a global campaign. We are aiming for trillions of dollars into ecosystem restoration. Um, and of course, there's lots of other stuff happening in 2020 that we are pushing the uh, Secretary General's food summit, food system summit, where we really want to push uh, nature positive agriculture. Um, and of course, the One Health Agenda, just today with Tedros uh, um, at Hanum Gebreyesus, as well as the DG for uh, FAO and OIE, we've la launched the One Health Science uh, Technical Panel that can really deal with the environment, veterinary and human health dimension. So that's kind of what we're working on. But the bottom line, these three crises. So there you go. UNEP is doing a lot, uh, would be a summary <laughs> of that answer, <laughs> and particularly around shining a light on these problems and what can be done about it. Um, uh, Inga, I've got a whole lot of my own questions I'd like to ask you, but I, I fear that as last time with Partha, uh, we're just not going to get through the audience questions unless I make a start right now. So I'm going to do that um, sure. many, many minutes ahead of plan. Um, the first one that I think is just directly related to what you've just been talking about, the, the, the agenda for this year, 2021, is from Daniel Scharf, who's asking about uh, whether we'll get everything sorted in COP15 in China in biodiversity. And if we don't, assuming we don't, would it be helpful to try to merge some of these agendas in COP26 in Glasgow, perhaps perhaps later, given the relationships, the interdependencies between um, addressing climate and addressing the biodiversity uh, and nature agenda? What, what are your thoughts on these twin processes that we have running and how we might make progress? 
look, we look upon these Rio conventions, desertification, climate change, and biodiversity, but also, frankly, their forerunners, CITES, the convention that deals with illegal and legal trade of uh, flora and fauna, uh, CMS, the convention that deals with migratory species, the ozone, Montreal and Vienna protocols that deals with ozone. We look upon them, frankly, as indivisible. We are hosting 17 conventions in UNAP, um, two conventions, a standalone convention that's climate and desertification, but the rest are hosted uh, by us. And so we see that one must mutually reinforce the other. We've got the Kigali protocol under ozone, but we know that when we reduce uh, emission uh, that are ozone depleting, they have huge impact on the climate side. We know that if we can, uh, mediate and and reduce climate uh, uh, climate change it will be better for ecosystems we understand that adaptation as well as resilience as well as mitigation means that we need to restore ecosystems that's a good thing for biodiversity if we don't do you know uh, monoculture and you do it well um and uh, and that's good for climate change so the indivisibility of these conventions is real but they are handled differently. One, you need to deal with shifting the transport and the energy sector, etc. And another one, you're dealing with uh, something quite unique that deals with unique ecosystems and biodiversity and species and megafauna, uh, mega diversity, etc. But what we do need to see and find and and push for is um, synergy. And what's very good. Uh, for the UK presidency is that it is intending to place nature and nature-based solutions firmly as one of the agenda points as we understand it. And that's very powerful because if all things go well, we will have the Kunming COP uh, in, I believe, October, and then that will be followed by the COP uh, in Glasgow, uh, which will give a very nice um, lift to the nature agenda, I expect. Thanks very much. I, I, I hope it answers Daniel's question pretty nicely. Um, next one is from Richard Vernon, uh, and he's taken the three planetary crises that you're speaking of and noted that arguably all three are being driven by population growth. Now, this is a topic that often comes up in Oxford Martin School discussions. We don't always dive into it because it's quite um, contentious, but uh, given the review's focus on population, we had, um, we had I think, quite a good and frank and um, thoughtful discussion about population and the management of population with Partha, who described himself as a liberal and didn't really want to go in for heavy-handed population control. But I'm, I'm wondering whether you want to, feel free to say not my cup of tea, but uh, would you like to have a, have a say anything about how we might think about the fundamental drivers uh, you know, it's population times consumption per capita, I guess, uh, driving many of these problems. Sure. What, what, what should we do about the population sure. side of things? Well, first of all, we need to understand that, yeah, of course, if we were one million, uh, one billion roaming around this earth, the, the pressure on the earth would be different. Mm. Um, that's clear. That's just basic. Uh, that's basic understanding. Everyone knows that. Yep. Um, the second point we need to take on board is the problem is not right now the woman in Africa who has five children. The problem is you and I and our yes. footprint, well, right? The, the top 1% uh, or the top 10% is responsible for some 80% uh, in terms of income is responsible for some 80% of emissions. And let's be clear, the top 10%, the top 10 uh, is something like, I forget, $79,000 a year. We had all these numbers in our last, in our emissions gap report. So they can be verified there. And the top 1% is people who earn what probably mo many people in, in Denmark and the UK earn. Uh, so this is not the, the jet setting. These are people with $150,000, $200,000 uh, a year. It's not, it is still rich, but it's not uber rich. Mm. So that's the first point. That's where the footprint is. That mm -hmm. is why the, the, the reduction in footprint and the injustice, uh, uh, the climate justice dimension has to be important. Now, having said that, the third point is we need to give gender equity. We need to have women being in charge of their lives uh, and in charge of the life decisions, including uh, uh, education, including when they get married, including um, uh, when they decide to have children and be agents of their own bodies. And these are the sort of 
basic things that we just need to deal with and not talk about the, 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 the sort of other dimensions. We know that if girls have no power and if they're not empowered under the law and in society and by tradition, chances are they may get married very young and not be able to make life decisions. We as women need to have agency over our life and our life choices, including our children, how many children we want. If we deal with these three bits, mm. we will have addressed a massive dimension of the population uh, issue. And that's sort of how I always respond to this because mm. there is a, a sort of emphasis on on societies that are poor where the, the normal thing to do is to have more children because then that's how you safeguard your own social safety net. But it is about poverty eradication and women empowerment uh, amongst others. Thank you. I think that's a good answer that will probably um, leave many people thinking hurrah uh, listening in, but let's, let's see. More questions will doubtless come. Um, I want to move now to a question from Rob Pepper, who's asking about the most effective interventions for protecting nature um, and his question is where, where would you put your money on the table and perhaps let me sharpen it up by saying you know if somebody just dropped a trillion US dollars on you said there you go UNEP spend that how you want want uh, what would you do how would you it's a, it's a tough question to ask be asked live sorry about that uh, it's almost <laughs> well, an interview question well, well, how would you spend that well, first of all, look, um, we're, this is for biodiversity, I think. The, 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 the question was around the priorities that I would want to invest in for biodiversity. Yes, for biodiversity. Look, um, there is a lot of talk right now about 30 by 30, 50 by 50, etc., which essentially is this idea that you need to protect in protected areas, 30% or what have you, uh, of our terrestrial and marine. And uh, under the Aichi targets, it was 10% marine and 17% terrestrial. We just might make it. But what I want to say for those percentages, right? We just might, we'll see. We're not there yet on either of them. Mm. But my point here is, whilst protected areas are great, and I would be the, I worked at IUC and they are mm. critical, but where we really need to invest is outside the protected areas. And that's why we need to understand that we cannot we need to have biodiversity on working landscapes, biodiversity in agricultural settings, mm -hmm. biodiversity in the urban landscape, understanding what we do when we subsidize, which we do in many countries, pesticides and insecticides, what we do when we, sub when we have uh, a huge amount of fertilizer and the nitrogen runoff into waterways, into groundwater, but also into the marine. And so it is about understanding that those 30 million trillion that you are giving me, that uh, we, we, we have to obviously do our protection uh, our, and it needs to be the quality and the quantity. So we don't want paper parks, we want quality management and quality uh, um, um, uh, and quantity, but that's not the sole answer. And if we just chase that, we are missing a bigger picture which mm. is that nature needs to live not just behind a fence in a protected area, but mm. where we are. And so in our gardens, what are we doing uh, ourselves in terms of do we use, what is it, Roundup or other things that have, you know, what, what are we doing and, how, and what are we buying and what are we incentivizing? Um, and so I will put my money there to ensure that farmers because farmers are our friends. We must never as environmentalists make farmers the enemy, but they need to get the kind of support to make the shifts that are nature positive. And uh, so that's where I would put uh, my emphasis, urban, uh, outside protected, obviously also invest a couple of trillion in the protected areas, but then uh, really <laughs> invest in, in, in the broader terrestrial and marine, including marine beyond national jurisdiction, um, where we see uh, deep sea mining and things like that. And with um, uh, ice melt happening, a broader encroachment potential into pristine areas. And we cannot afford to see that without understanding the consequences. So I can't risk asking a little bit of a follow-up. Do you think, would you reserve any funding for 
uh, research and development into technologies that might offer demand substitution. It's kind of an interest of, of mine. You, we, we know that an awful lot of habitat destruction is driven by um, you know, various animal products. And we know that if we were to deliver those proteins in alternative ways, either plant-based or cellular-based proteins, we could cut the land uh, requirements down perhaps by as much as a factor of five or, or 10. Um, yeah. would, would that be something that you, if you had a trillion, would you reserve any of it for that sort of thing? Or do you not really place much hope in the, in the tech side of things? No, absolutely. I place hope both in the tech side, but also in the choice side. We have to have mm -hmm. a conversation about the diets we are having. Mm -hmm. Because uh, look, um, maybe you and I um, and people who live like we do um, can be very happy about the way we get our protein. I'm a lifelong vegetarian, but that's another story. Um, but, 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 you know, um, and it's at uh, protein matters, meat protein matters in many countries, but we can't all have steak every night. Mm -hmm. And if seven and a half billion people w wish to do that, because now we are wealthy enough to do it, it does just does not compute. And so we need to have an honest conversation about dietary choices, as well as looking at alternative ways of getting protein, uh, but not um, legislating on this point because that just, that will completely not work and, and it would be completely hypocritical. Mm. Um, so I think we need to ensure that meat diets are available, um, but we also need to ensure that we can do that with a degree of sustainability in mind and carrying capacity in mind. Mm. And I think a lot of it comes from you know, ensuring that we encourage, um, I mean, plant content in our diet from early on and um, that we teach kids what is delicious and what is great. Um, and I think that each of these have a, have a place, uh, but I do not believe that we should uh, outlaw in any way. Now, what I'm seeing is here in the UK, for example, which is quite interesting, that we are we are seeing quite a lot of vegetarian and vegan options, uh, and a lot of flexitarianism, which is also interesting. People sort of uh, eating a, a more plant-rich diet, and um, part of what we need to do is clearly have an understanding that the current system is sort of a double-edged sword it's shaped by the cheaper food paradigm which aims at producing more food quickly and cheaply but we do so at the cost to biodiversity and a cost to our health uh, and so understanding that so the cost gets shifted over on our health systems diabetes cardiovascular etc mm -hmm. um which we are then not seeing when we buy the cheap food but it yeah. comes it shows up elsewhere in the economy I mean, is it an implication of what you said that perhaps in many countries meat is too cheap? Um, it might be. I don't. I don't actually know enough about that to have an honest. That's sort of an honest, honest opinion. But I think if we want to internalize the environmental uh, cost, um, then that's something that we need to look at. But uh, in some countries it may be too cheap. In some countries it may be too expensive. I think it depends entirely where you're placed. I'm sitting in Nairobi and I can tell you it's very expensive here and it's not the average family that can afford it. Right, okay. Um, moving along to a question from Charlie Freitag here. Uh, he's interested in measuring and kind of uh, assessing the biodiversity impacts of investment portfolios. And of course, um, UNEP's financial initiative has been doing great work in these sorts of areas for many years now, well over a decade, possibly more. Um, his question is, where, where do you start? Uh, where's, where's the kind of best place to look for guidance as to how to measure the biodiversity impact of a, an investment portfolio, given that um, you know, this is presumably fairly tricky? Uh, and I guess I could give some pointers, but uh, wh where would you direct Charlie? I'm sure you can. Well, you, you're probably better at it than I, but look, there is um, there is a coalition of organization called the Science-Based uh, Initiative. And it's very much taking a leaf out of the climate story, which we all know very well with the science-based targets for climate. Now, you could argue that that was easier because we would look just at emissions. 
I have always said no. We just simplified it down to one factor. Mm -hmm. We didn't talk about ocean warming. We didn't talk about species lost due to climate change. We didn't create uh, such a complicated setting that in the target uh, science-based targets for climate, we couldn't get at something that against which companies could disclose their, their, the footprint and the impact of their portfolio. So in the science-based um, target initiative, uh, uh, target initiative for, for biodiversity, what a good number of scientists and organizations are working on is coming up with something that companies can deploy. And that's very much also what the task force on nature related disclosures is working on. And so, um, and, and there is a beginning of this, but what we do need to do is to have a degree of understanding uh, so that it doesn't become greenwashing and so that it has a genuineness to it that is comparable across portfolio. That's why getting a clear uh, post-2020 framework with the, with the goals that can then be translated will matter um, because then uh, smart organizations will surely come up with clear science-based targets that companies can uh, measure their portfolio on. And let's begin with those that really have footprint, timber, pulp and paper, palm oil, soy, those that have a wheat that have significant footprint in if we just want to look at commodities, but then uh, let's look not just at the countries that are growing them, but at the consumption of these things, because it will probably turn out that you and I and our economies are consuming most of the palm oil. Uh, so we just need to think around, around this in a, in a way that does not cause further poverty in countries that are producing and export uh, exporting, but that can uh, readjust. Um, and so I think what we're seeing is some companies have already been leaning in and experimenting with this. Um, we see that in the context of the World Economic Forum, where some interesting work has been happening with a, with a series of companies we still have quite some some way to go and of course getting the financiers the investors the insurers and the bankers to align with this will be the next the next the next to do item a slightly big one that unep will need to take on in in the context of the unep financial uh unep fi Thanks. I think you've, you've also uh, partially answered Henry Grubb's question about the, the additional complexity of biodiversity compared to uh, climate change. I mean, there's good um, disclosure through CDP, uh, not on all of the interests, not, not all of the metrics that Charlie will be interested in, of course. Uh, and I think in general, there could be a lot more disclosure here. Now, I want to move, shift gears a little bit and ask you a question which I'm probably going to fail to do justice to. So my apologies to Christoph place who's put it there's a lot of interest in this i think he's interested in alternative currencies um whether cryptocurrencies or barter arrangements or you know very local currencies and asking the question could we use these new and innovative forms of currencies um perhaps to as a tool of incentivization for biodiversity protection. And I think um, what Christoph and, and various others who have commented on this idea is getting at is perhaps if the conventional monetary system isn't working for us and if valuing nature in terms of dollars and pounds and euros and renminbi is, uh, is not working, um, perhaps some of these newer forms of kind of proto uh, I was going to say proto-capitalism, but that's not quite right either. Uh, new, newer monetary systems might be able to help. So apologies to everybody interested in this. Um, and there's also a related question about the environmental impacts of cryptocurrencies. But you know, I just wondered, have, have you or your teams done much thinking about the intersection between novel currencies and environmental protection or environmental damage for that matter? So the impact and the carbon footprint, we all know and understand, and that's something that we cannot walk away from, right? But that's known um, and and complex. Um, I, I think I have to be honest and say, no, we have not done uh, detailed work on this. What we have understood very clearly in our new strategy that we are that we just had approved in the United Nations Environmental Assembly that happened a couple of months ago and which will go into uh, kick into force at the end of the year. It's a four year strategy where we are 
making a significant emphasis on the digital transformation, where we will try to work uh, on AI, on digital transformation for environmental um, stewardship and protection, and clearly understanding what under, uh, engaging with with crypto, engaging with uh, big data, engaging engaging with AI is something that we're all saying, and people like me don't understand the first of it because I'm completely not qualified to speak to these issues. But there are people who are, and so what we are, uh, are establishing now is a network of people who can help. Us. I mean, I, I'm lucky to have some brilliant colleagues who work in this yeah. field, but that's not where we have the armies of people. And so we need to reach out and understand more. Um, and whether whether that will be an opportunity to drive funding there, we've seen what, um, I mean, we saw what Douchecoin was doing just uh, recently, and it's sort of shocking that what community action can do and stand up companies and not, as the case may be. And that was just sort of done as a joke uh, initially when it was launched, as I understand. So I think there are ways of trying to begin to understand this new market and this new tool and instrument, but we are not there. I have to say also finally that the Secretary General is very, very interested in digital transformation and has launched a digital transformation task force and platform and strategy precisely to lift the UN into into uh, 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 this this sphere we have and just a final point i would say we have promoted uh, digital transformation through what we call the coalition for digital environmental sustainability that was co-launched at the time when the secretary general's uh, digital roadmap was launched and that is an open multi-stakeholder community of uh, engaged digital actors in the environmental space. It's more than data. We have the World Environment uh, Situation Room at UNEP, but it's looking at how we can use that technology for good. But that's a very bad answer to Christoph because it sounds like he knows much more about this than I, I will and I do. We'll, we'll have to have a, a, another session on digital currencies and the environment at some point. That'd be fun, actually. I, I could so. learn a lot. Um, I want to, we're running low on time as, as always. Um, I want to come to, well, actually take the point about cryptocurrencies, which, which do enable a kind of coordination that doesn't have a central actor. And come back to this question of international coordination around here, because as we know, many of the biodiversity that we need protecting many of our natural assets are global public goods some of them are sitting within national boundaries others aren't and kind of intriguingly uh last uh, last conversation with partha he put forward this idea which is um, in the review page 40 if you're interested uh and 72 that um perhaps we need a new international organization, maybe like the World Bank or the IMF, he said, to monitor and manage the global commons, and in particular, perhaps imposing charges on the open seas, and then using the revenues um, raised to support the protection of global public goods within particular boundaries. And, and that, if it were to work, would be an answer to Andy Johnson's question about, you know, how do we help countries that are nature rich and cash poor? So I guess the, the broader question Inger, is how do we go about achieving the kind of necessary international coordination here? What are the what are the best mechanisms to to manage the flows of finance from where the money is sitting to where it needs to go to protect nature? Look, I mean, I'll get to that, but can I just say that right now we have a pandemic where vaccine hoarding has been the name of the game. If mm. you had the money for the vaccines, you kept them for your population mm. and the rest of the world has not had access. Commitments have been made to COVAX, the, the collective vaccination effort, and they're not being fo fo uh, mm. followed through. That's just for a little vaccine, right? That's just for a little vaccine. So the first point is really international solidarity means what? International solidarity. Words are easy, but actually actions have to follow through. And that means that people in the wealthier countries actually need to insist on that solidarity. Mm. And are we ready to do that? Uh, I would hope that we are, but the lessons from the vaccine story are not that good. 
Um, so here in Kenya, not even 1% are vaccinated. So, so this is, the, so here we are. But now, um, so the idea of, of living up to the commitments we have made over the decades is real. And part of course is absolutely right. We've made the commitments on the biodiversity. If we had lived up and delivered what we promised at COP10, we'd be in a very different setting for biodiversity today. If we had delivered and understood what we, what science told us uh, from the IPCC on climate, we would be very different. So the first thing is really, before we begin a, a never-ending consultation on establishing this big Oedipus that I can see in a, in a mind's eye would be very attractive, but we haven't even been able to agree on a carbon tax. So I think we have a long way to go. Article 6 remains unfinished as far as the Paris Accord is concerned. So we probably can't get multilateral agreement to such a grandiose idea, however interesting it might be, academically speaking. So let's do this. Let's deliver on the commitments we've made. Let's deliver on the conventions we've made. And I'd hope that the multilateral organizations that are charged with environmental stewardship, which is UNEP, um, would receive the adequate funding and the adequate support and the, the expectations. People should demand things of us too, that we can, that we have the, the ability and the teeth to deliver uh, what is needed. Um, it's, it's hard right now in the multilateral setting um, it has become easier as we have sort of seen the U.S. come back into the climate accord, etc. Mm. But there are divisions and you just need to open your newspaper to understand that these divisions that reflect in the global you know, geopolitics are obviously also reflected in multilateralism. But if we are concerned about the next generation, if we are concerned about sustainability and poverty reduction, even in the wealthier countries, we have to take care of our planet because that is what sustains us. So I want to pick up on the, the point you made there about international solidarity and, and values and try and, if I can, and probably get, we're getting towards the end, a group a few questions into one. So there's one from Viviana on um, the ethics, again, of, of valuing nature. And, and her point really is, isn't it human values that need to be shifted? You know, it's perhaps not a population issue, it's a consumption issue, and we need to think about our values. And, um, you know, Jesse's, uh, Jesse Apavu, my apologies for pronouncing your surname correctly, made a kind of similar point, that, that if we're using um, the economic financial frameworks that we have, that's actually been depleting nature with profit as a, as a key motivation, isn't isn't this to get things backwards? We're putting a square peg in a round hole. We, we need to be rethinking the underlying objectives and, and values. And actually to add another one, Patrick Walkton has said, well, don't we need different measures of what success looks like? Which is kind of related to the point about what we value, what we find important. Do we need a different metric, uh, not GDP, to me me measure progress? And, and you've already spoken about inclusive wealth as a as a metric so i wonder if you might kind of reflect upon the the solidarity human values how do we get a shift towards i guess a more enlightened human population that realizes that we we just need to work together on these issues or we're stuffed yeah um i i mean these are brilliant brilliant points and i think that um the i, I will say that i think that the generate the younger generation today is much further ahead in that enlightenment mm. than the generation um, of, uh, of past. And maybe it's because the crisis that is looming on the horizon. So that's the first point. Now, as mm. Greta would always say, well, you know, don't put it on us. You know, you, you guys fix it. You're still sitting in the chairs. Mm. And that's a very valuable point that she, she makes again and again. Um, so, but but I do think that that Viviana is correct. It is the human values that need shifting. We launched uh, just um, a month and a half ago a report called "Making Peace with Nature." Mm. Um, it's a significant report uh, that we um, and in which we describe that we need exactly what um, Patrick spoke to 
a fundamental rethink of what success look like looks like a fundamental rethink of economy a fundamental rethink of 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 society of businesses there's lots of detail in it but it essentially is um is challenging ourselves to rethink the economic system as we know them today and that's what jesse was saying uh, because if we continue and i will say that we still need growth in the certain uh, countries um, so i just have to slide that in uh, because you still have 100 million people going to bed hungry every night 800 million people going to bed hungry every night and over a billion people living in extreme poverty but we also need to have a redistribution uh, across um, across a global setting but uh, say but but i will say that yes it is about values yes it is about a fundamental shift in our framework and yes it is about having different measures of what success looks like so the question is how to right mm. uh, because uh, these are the issues that become difficult but that is where we as voters we as global citizens we as uh, academicians and educators and students and international bureaucrats like myself we have to speak out and demand things um, because that's how systems change that's how they changed in the past that's how fundamental societal shifts happen in that we demand it. And at times, the popular demand for change is ahead of the political will. Yeah. But it is by driving the popular demand that the political will shift. The Secretary General has often said, power is not given, it is taken. Um, he says that often when he speaks to young people and or when he speaks to women who are or other oppressed groups uh, around the world. And it is true, but it is about driving that that demand. Uh, uh, and I think we, well, by events such as what you have here, we are helping drive it in the right direction. And a, a quick kind of postscript to that. Um, I'm just going to tack on a question by Joseph, which is that if we've got to pressure the politicians uh, and we've got to build these social movements to think about, you know, enlightenment value, what's important in a different way. His question is, well, isn't this sort of economic paradigm, the dusk of review that I work in, that you work in, could that alienate the very people who we need to get passionate about these questions to drive change? Is it, is it perhaps a kind of paradox or an irony that the, that the thing that you need to drive the shift in the financial and the economic systems isn't the economics and the finance, it's the passion and the heart and the, and the social movements? Well, you need both. Because um, at the end of the day, uh, society runs on on companies, on financing. It doesn't run on on a planned economy, and I don't think that that's the direction of travel. And so we need to ensure. I go back to where we started: that the guardrails that you and I set, or that we ask our governments to set, are such that the economics are. Uh, driving in the direction of long-term sustainability but um, and we need to get those financiers just as passionate and just as engaged as the activists and the thing is that therein lies the opportunities for the future in renewable in green in nature positive agriculture in sustainable consumption and production that's where opportunities will lie and then in all the aspects I mentioned in relation to gender and empowerment. Well, I think that is a marvelous place to wrap up this very enjoyable conversation. Thank you very much, Inga, for your time. Uh, and I'm sure others have enjoyed it too. I'm sorry we still have well over a dozen, if not more, questions remaining. I will log them, we'll try and get to them in subsequent sessions. As I said earlier, we have a session on the 3rd of June with Professor Dame Henrietta Moore and Sir Charles Godfrey and on the 17th of June with Natalie Seddon and, and me, I'll be back again chairing that one. Um, so it remains really to thank you, Inga, for all the work you're doing uh, on this agenda and on many others, as, as we've heard, uh, and thanks for your partnership and support uh, of what Oxford's doing here too, and thank you very much, of course, for your time today. Thanks. Thank you so much, Cameron, and thank you to everybody who participated. Thank you.